Hello and welcome to Theology Unleashed. Today we're going to do a little review of the debate. We called it a discussion, but really it turned into a debate between Matt Dillahunty and Dr. Howard Resnick, aka H.D. Goswami. So Matt Dillahunty was actually... On an interpersonal level, he, he was quite nice. He drove traffic towards my channel. He's pleasant to deal with. He told jokes. And although the debate got quite heated, uh, he's still happy to come on again. And he never took any of it personally or means any personal offense. For him, it's just ideas. Um, so I thought I'd start with a, a compliment. And then now, we so we've got Adi Purushadas and Amala Gorodas. Uh, do you guys just want to introduce yourselves quickly? Yeah, sure. So my name is Amala Gordas, and I live in the D.C. area. And I've been uh, involved with Krishna consciousness since about 97. So it was nice to hear this debate. And I think we can just get... I'll, I'll let Adi Purush introduce, and I'll give some oh, okay. on the debate. Yeah, I'm Adi Purush Das. I'm currently a Ph.D. student at Cambridge studying... Uh, the Chaitanya Vaishnava tradition and the problem of evil. So. All right, so we can launch into it then. Uh, Amla Gora Das is going to start by giving us uh, his summary, and then uh, we'll each give a few comments, and then we'll play a couple clips and make some re give some responses to it. Awesome. Thanks, Arjun Prabhu. So what I found throughout the debate was it kept going to some of the basics that were launched in the beginning, where Matt Dillahunty, he sort of introduced uh, his point of view and said, okay, let's get into how we're going to discuss this. We'll get into our assumptions and, and our rules of sort of rational discussion. And then on those rules, I think there was some basic agreement, and then the whole debate went forward. But what I saw was that when we went into the rules of rationality, it was sort of just assumed by Matt Dillahunty and it was just accepted. But the whole concept of an epistemology to explain your assumptions wasn't delved into. It was from the point of view, okay, I have these assumptions and this is how things are just sort of working for us. So let's break down anything else that anyone presents. And and so I didn't feel like we got really into a deep epistemology, and it was more surface level of a discussion. But what I was hoping to get into more was an actual epistemology of how uh, how Vedic epistemology or Gaudiya Vaishnava epistemology is presented. So, yeah, that that was what I what I found in going through it. And then towards the end, we found some very interesting arguments presented by uh, Hridayananda Maharaj about about how we can conceive of, uh, of truth as, as self-evident. So I found that was interesting towards the end. All right, do you want to give some comments, Adi Purusha? Yeah. Um, See, so yeah, the beginning uh, was good. They were trying to talk about um, some of their uh, assumptions and trying to discuss what it, uh, you know, they were sort of laying out their foundation out at the beginning. But then after that, it really, uh, it was, it got very complicated because um, Matt Dillahunty sort of had his assumptions and he had, uh, he's assumed, he was really uh, pushing that science is the ultimate epistemology. There is no other um, sort of valid means of acquiring knowledge. And this was sort of his assumption throughout. And whenever Riedenunda, or uh, Dr. Howard Resnick, tried to sort of explain his views. It wasn't so much of a discussion, which I think it was supposed to originally be, but sort of Matt Dilla hunting, just uh, sort of debating him and not really letting him explain his epistemology and basically keep continually harping on this point that, you know, science is the ultimate, science is the ultimate, where Dr. Howard Resnick was actually trying to say, okay, uh, let's just try to understand what a spiritual epistemology would look like Let's try to understand the parameters. And he tried to explain it, but Matt Dillahunty was just sort of really in this sort of scientism kind of mindset, like science is the ultimate, you can't know anything else. And it, it was it got a little bit awkward because it, um, it just ended up turning into a debate when it really should have been a discussion. Um, I, I noticed had some similar observations to 
Pamela Gora and Natty Purusha. Um, I feel like Hrida Nanagosami went in there for a friendly discussion and Matt Dillahunty was sort of turning it into a, a boxing match. And um, uh, yeah, Dr. Howard Resnick didn't, didn't really want to engage in that. Um, and it was, I listened to it back uh, in bits and pieces here and there and it, there was some somewhat of antagonism on Matt's part. And uh, perhaps he he's used to his, his usual script that he runs against Christians, which is a logically sound debunkers to a lot of the arguments Christians offer, offer. And then going into this, he was quite confident to have good debunks of Howard Resnick's arguments, but um, that wasn't necessarily the case. I feel like he didn't take the time to listen to the arguments being presented and try to understand them and was largely just trying to pick them apart. Um, so maybe we'll play a couple clips now. This this one's from the beginning of the video. Um, I'll just move this over here. I'm going to play um, your clip, your first two clips that you linked, uh, Amalagora. we're talking about um, how we are going to evaluate claims about the world to find out whether or not they're real, there is an element of scientism that I'm perfectly fine with because the, the presuppositions, the base ones that I start with are things like uh, I have to presuppose reason, identity, non-contradiction, excluded middle, because you don't have any choice but to presuppose them. You, you would have to assume they were true to try to prove they were false, and that leads to a problem. I have to have a presupposition that I experience reality and that th this reality is subject to investigation and that it is sensibly uniform or uniform enough to not be uh, chaotic and uh, immune to investigation and that my senses are generally reliable. We know they're not perfectly reliable. We optical illusions, et cetera. But the fact that we can show when and how and when and to what extent they're reliable kind of confirms their reliability. And we can tell the difference um, between like reality and a dream state. And even though I can't tell you which one is the really real, <laughs> is the reality that I'm experiencing right now, is this the really real reality or is the dream reality the really real one? As a, as a pragmatic notion, um, not only do I spend more time apparently in this reality, but it's the one that seems to be uniform and testable. It's like I can I can never flap my wings and or flap my arms and fly here. And yet in a dream world, I might be able to do this. And so even though I can't demonstrate which one's more real, the absurdity of a dream world and the inconsistency of a dream world at least makes it immune to that sort of investigation. And so after those presuppositions, it's just a matter of um, I value skepticism and particularly modern skepticism, modern, modern scientific skepticism, which is proportioning my confidence to the evidence. And in some cases, since we're going to talk about evidence, I'm not aware of, like, if you could give an example of a claim that is supported by non-empirical evidence that we should in fact accept, that would be, in, in, I would be keenly interested in that. All right. Was that enough of that clip, Emily Gora? Yeah, I think after that, Dr. Resnick just said he agreed with it. I mean, there wasn't any pushback that uh, that I recall. So from that clip, I was expecting a lot more pushback and expecting a bit more grounding because um, I think he sort of gave a basis of how he would evaluate an epistemology or his rules for doing so, even though his own epistemology doesn't really support it, right? It's giving, so it was giving some, some, some guidelines or outlines of why he thinks his epistemology is acceptable. So what I thought was that, you know, we have a Vedic epistemology. It was, we have pratyaksha, anumana, and shabda. There's our sense perception, testimony from others, and then um, inference. So 
So that wasn't gotten into at all. It wasn't analyzed how whatever uh, Matt Delahunty was saying was only sense perception and claiming that sense, sense perception is sufficient and his our own ability to verify something is sufficient for us to know an epist- is is sufficient for us to know the truth, and that's the epistemology. So that wasn't really um, that wasn't really kind of laid out by Dr. Resnick that this is not really an, we don't really have an agreement or I don't have an agreement with that because even the concept of accepting testimony that a truth from someone else can be acceptable as truth and then having that means of testimony being a valid uh, way to gain truth that was not explained and unless you ex- unless you accept that then all the assumptions that were made they have no grounding unless someone else tells you okay the world is rational you can assume it but you can't know it so there's no there's no uh, connection between epistemology and the assumptions so that's what i got out of that first section yeah i feel like the assumptions that are made within science weren't really gone into when I argue epistemology, I like to point out that we need to apply the same level of skepticism that we apply to one epistemology to the other. So if we want to say personal experience is an evidence, then we have to say personal experience is an evidence for matter or the existence of other people too. And one uh, objection people give to that argument is the difference is when we experience uh, things in the material world, we have a shared experience of it. Everybody sees the same table uh, and so on. Whereas these uh, so-called spiritual experiences, uh, it's one person having their, a subjective experience, so we can't distinguish it from a hallucination. But that doesn't solve the problem of solipsism because I don't actually know that other people are having the same experience I'm having. All I know is that I'm having an experience of other people having an experience of what I'm having an experience of. Yeah, absolutely. And the the fact that you have to assume that we're not in a solipsism world means that your epistemology has no way to accept or reject that claim of solipsism, solipsism, right? There's no, you can't accept it or reject it. And so, okay, let's just get around that problem. We'll assume it's not really relevant and we'll go on with our lives, but that's not sufficient. And then the fact that you have all these rules and you're the epistemology that you want to use or the methods that you want to use is not sufficient in and of itself. And then you want to apply those same rules just means you're applying an inconsistent epistemology or an inconsistent philosophy to another philosophy. And so it, I think we do need to present our epistemology in a maybe clearer way to explain some of why we don't have the, those problems. So if we are living in a rational world, then the fact that someone else is able to experience that the world is rational and tells us that it's rational, that is a method of us gaining truth. Now, we can still evaluate the claim, but the fact that testimony is a valid way to communicate truth, I don't, I'm don't. i not clear how that really works out in a, in a Western uh, epistemology. And I'm pretty ignorant about a lot of these things, but I, wasn't, I didn't gain any clarity on that. Yes, yeah, Stephen M. Barr in his book, Modern Physics and Ancient Faith, talks a lot about um, epistemology. And, and one of his points is that in Western science, uh, statements from authority are the bread and butter. It's a huge part of it. N- nobody can do science without trusting the statements of other scientists. Like you, you, you know, like a meta-analysis is considered uh, one of the highest forms of research in terms of like establishing something conclusively. And all a meta-analysis is is somebody's gone through and read the statements of other scientists and trusted. What they're, say, what they're saying to be true. Mm-hmm. And of course, the, the objection to this would be that, yeah, but we could, you know, go into the lab where those research papers were done and scrutinize what was done. But this comes into the point where they had, they had a lot of back and forth on um, what Dr. Resnick was calling the circular reasoning that Matt Delahunty was committing. And Matt Delahunty was asking for demonstrability. You know, Dr. Resnick was saying, you're just engaged in the same circularity of thinking that 
the proof for a spiritual science should be the same as the proof for a material science. So, you know, Richard Dawkins can demonstrate that he has a thorough knowledge of biology, but that's because biology is, it deals with the empirical world. So that the claims made in biology are accessible to empirical investigation, which means it's far more demonstrable. And Matt was claiming when he says demonstrable, he doesn't mean empirical. He doesn't mean it has to be demonstrated in the same way material things are demonstrated, but it has to be demonstrable. But I think what he was doing there was actually a uh, an ambiguity fallacy. Where, you know, it's like, an ambiguity fallacy is where you use, uh, well, it's not, not quite an ambiguity fallacy. An ambiguity fallacy is where you use the same word twice to mean two different things. John Lennon's a beetle, yeah. therefore he must have, you know, so many legs and be a small insect. Uh, whereas what he was doing is using, the, uh, I'm not sure the name of this fallacy, but using two different words. Fallacy of equivocation. Fallacy of equivocation, using two different words to mean the same thing. And when he used the first word, he was saying, this is not what I'm doing. And when he used the second word, he's saying, but I'm asking for this. But really, he meant the same things by those two words. Because he, when, he meant when, for something to be demonstrable to everybody, it has to be empirical. Whereas if something's just demonstrable in a spiritual sense to people who have, have become qualified, then it's only demonstrable to those select people. And... It seems like part of the disagreement was a lack of clarity and perhaps Dr. Resnick could have done a better job of saying, here's my epistemology and this is what it achieves. And, you know, say, so the claim is a little bit more modest. We're not saying we can prove a spiritual science to, you know, every man, woman or child, regardless of how ignorant they are or, you know, what their uh, biases are. He was saying we can prove a spiritual science to people who undergo the process of becoming qualified to assess the proof for the spiritual science, which actually, I think this comes, uh, I don't know. Do you, do you guys want to comment on any of what I just said? Oh uh, yeah. So I think one theme throughout this whole debate is Dillahunty sort of had this, uh, what I'd say is epistemological Im imperialism. He sort of claimed that science is like the absolute authority as far as understanding knowledge. And, uh, I think this is, fallacious because let's say there is a spiritual dimension of reality and there is a material dimension of reality. Uh, you know, we can accept that science um, is the best way of knowing about our material reality. But if there's a spiritual reality, then the epistemological parameters for understanding that spiritual dimension would obviously be different than the parameters that uh, we establish for studying the material world. So I think Dillahunty... Uh, he sort of insisted that if there's a spiritual dimension of reality, it should adhere to the same epistemological parameters as um, how uh, science uh, studies this material world. But I don't, I don't know. I think there's, it's really uh, an assumption that is really um, uh, just really flawed because you know if there is a spiritual dimension of reality, then we should evaluate it on its own basis and not on the basis of. Uh, how we evaluate science and Dill Hunty's continual um, insistence on you know demonstration, demonstration, demonstration uh, just presupposes that the demonstration of a spiritual reality is the same as the demonstration of empirical reality, and I don't think there's any reason to uh, assume that they should be the same. Well, you know, if there's a spiritual reality, you know, evaluate it the way that it's meant to be evaluated, rather than demand that it adhere to science. Uh, Science parameters. Doctor, <coughs> sorry, Dr. Resnick made a good point about um, thousands, billions of people across thousands of years isn't reliable. And uh, the the atheist objection to that would be like that's a a pop, you know, appeal to popularity fallacy. You're just saying because mm. billions of people have believed something that it must be true, but um. I think there's two, two, two ways we need to respond to that. One is that just because um, we're not saying that it's just because people believe that we're, we're adding a bit of epistemology to it, that, that um, these people are, you know, are convinced that it's been demonstrated to them. Like, I mean, how do you, mm -hmm. how do you ever differentiate 
somebody feeling like something's demonstrated to them and believing it from something actually being demonstrated, right? Like Stephen mm-hmm. Hawking's and all these scientists feel like they have, you know, stumbled across proof for many things, but you know, a science has been proven wrong several times and it could, could happen again. Although mm-hmm. there are lots of things that it would appear like science generally knows. So we should acknowledge that, but mm. You know, looking from the outside, somebody who's not qualified to appreciate those proofs, all they know is these people who seem qualified seem convinced of these proofs. So the real question is qualification Mm -hmm. because, you know, if someone's qualified to appreciate the proof and they're convinced something's true, then that's a valid epistemology. It's not an appeal to popularity in a sense, provided there's actually, you know, the evidence can be assessed and so on. But in the case of a spiritual science, the, the evidence cannot exactly be assessed. All you can do is become qualified yourself to appreciate the proof. Mm. Yeah. Now, I wasn't clear from the debate if this was being... I did hear this argument about this spiritual material dichotomy, and I think Dr. Resnick brought this up. And then I think there was some rightful pushback from Matt Delahunty because... You know, how do you break, where's the line? What's, you're saying there could be a spiritual science, but okay, give me a spiritual claim. There was a little back and forth on that, but I think we should take a step and we should look at that. Do we want to claim something like that? Because it's not that there's a Vedic spiritual epistemology necessarily, right? If we talk about what is an epistemology, how do we evaluate truth? I don't know if we want to say that we have different material and spiritual epistemologies. Uh, well, the, there is there's mm-hmm. different epistemologies for different truth claims. Like if you want to, um, you know, demonstrate the temperature at which boil, water boils, it's it's very much, you know, s- sense, you know, like you boil the water and you have the thermometer there and you can see it. Whereas if you want to, you know, demonstrate, you know, metaphysical claims, it's not something you can demonstrate in quite the same way. So some things are experiential. Like in the Vedic epistemology, there's there's well, the way Jiva Goswami breaks it down. There's you know sense perception, uh, logic, and then statements from authority, and then of course statements of, of authority in the special category where they're a purusheya or you know coming from a divine origin. And um, I guess you know the question would be how do you verify that? So you know someone's how you 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 know like. Uh, I think Ashish Jalela gives the example of uh, uh, getting a password. So the the process of verifying some knowledge is a lot less intensive than the process of acquiring that same knowledge. And in some cases, it could be impossible. Like, you know, like brute force is one way a password can be broken. And that basically means you have a computer program which tries every possible combination of characters in an attempt to hack the password. And uh, if it's a sufficiently difficult password, that could be impossible. It could take hundreds of years for the, that software to break a sufficiently difficult uh, password. Whereas if someone just gives you the password, you go and type it in and, you, and you're in. So with a, the spiritual knowledge, we can't achieve it via sense perception or anuman, but we can confirm it by applying it and seeing that it's consistent with logic and sense perception when applied. It, it, it checks out our inner truth compass, verifies it. Only if it's applied, though. And so we kind of get the build up to that spiritual epistemology through the testimony, right? We go from testimony to then a porosheo, which is the spiritual testimony or infallible testimony. But we do have that stepping stone of, a, of testimony. And so if we do want to talk about the spiritual side of it, then I guess we still have to get introduced in the same, it's going in the same direction and then just taking a little bit of a step further to spiritual, I would say. So I, I think that we didn't get to that. I think in the debate where we got into, I think it skipped that step where we tried to jump to the spiritual side. Um, Skipped which bit, sorry. Skipping the part about receiving testimony, and I, I do think that was gotten into a little bit, right? I think we there were some sections mm. where that that was the claim was made by Dr. Resnick that you know you cannot verify you cannot verify the results of the scientific experiment yourself. You're trusting someone else, and Matt Delahunty said that well, that's not relevant because I can I can verify it. Like the, the, 
the system that's been put in place allows me to verify it. Well, doc, and so, yeah. Dr. Resnick asked, um, how many people have actually assessed for themselves the proof for scientific claims like quantum physics and the Big Bang and so on? And Matt Dillahunty didn't answer that question. He said 100% of people who tried it. Mm-hmm. And uh, Dr. Resnick gave some pushback to that and said that that's, that's not actually the case. Some people go and you know study science at a university level and then go on to become science deniers. And uh, uh, Richard Thompson, or Sataputta Prabhu, he, he gave this argument about measuring gravity. Uh, I may get some of the details wrong. I'm not a scientist, but it, measuring gravity is how, it, the, the the process for you know measuring the strength of gravity. It's not seeing how fast things drop, but how strong the gravitational forces. And apparently, the process is extremely sensitive. So vibrations from cars driving past on the road outside can interfere with the experiment uh, to the point where if a if a science student attempts to measure gravity and fails, they'll simply be told, you didn't do it right. So in science, when you're dealing with processes where there's a lot of subtle variables, then if somebody fails to get the same result that is known to be the result you get from that process, they'll simply be told, you didn't do the process right. So it's the same for the spiritual science. You know, uh, Matt Dillahunty asked this question. So if someone, you know, applies himself to the process of bhakti yoga and doesn't come to the same conclusion that you've come to, how do I know which one's right? Because you've both done the same thing. And the answer would be, they must not have done quite the same thing. And there's all these subtle levels of motivation and so on. I think I'd like to play one clip here. Uh, so there's this point where Dr. Resnick was talking about the, the process of verifying and then um, make sure I've got the yeah so this this is the one um, let me cut to every relation may not be that way but it is a desire to do everything everything in one's power to to help or, 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 or to please the person you love because you think the person is worthy of that sure I, 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 okay. So if you mean by giving of the self, evidently in order to be spiritual or in order to have this spiritual experience, I must desire to do, but that is exactly the same as a self-reinforcing delusion. It, that is the priming of the pump that I'm talking about, where if you tell someone, Hey, you really need to want this to experience it. Well, that's true Uh-oh. in relationships. It, it, mm. Yeah. So that's, then they had some, a bit more back and forth. So, um, Earlier in the discussion, Matt Delante talked about this priming of the pump that, you know, if you give somebody an expectation, then you're priming them and then they're going to come to that conclusion because of a bias or a, a preconceived notion rather than the thing actually verify, being verified for them. And uh, Dr. Resnick pushed back on that by saying it was the same thing that is true in science. You, you get decades, you know, you know the university training and science is a, a long amount of uh, priming of the pump about this physicalist worldview. But I think in, in yeah. some sense, this, that's a valid pushback. We just need to show how it's not actually something that creates biases. Mm-hmm. It's actually necessary to get the sort of training, to get this expectation that yeah. Krishna will reciprocate. And, you know, it's a, it's a, you know, a sort of the bhakti element. I think he's also way too dismissive here. Uh, I think his sort of reasoning is if you're trying to love Krishna through bhakti yoga, that desire is like priming the pump. Uh, But I think he fails to acknowledge that that's just one possible explanation of why someone actually experiences um, the results of having a relationship with Krishna. I mean, he's very dismissive of the possibility that Krishna does actually exist. And when you meet certain conditions you can actually experience a relationship with them that's actually genuinely grounded in a uh, supernatural encounter with God rather than some sort of psychological mechanisms. I mean, I think Dillahunty, I mean, what you have is you have a naturalistic explanation and a theistic explanation for a certain phenomenon. And Dillahunty says his logic is basically there's a natural explanation for it. Therefore, that natural explanation is true. And he's very dismissive of the theistic explanation and offers no really serious reason why it couldn't possibly be true. 
Yeah, well, there's there's two things I'd say back to that. One is by this kind of skepticism is is actually quite devastating for epistemology in general because you're basically telling people that they can't trust their intuitions about reality and their their experiences of reality. And if you're going to say that, then you've you've got problems for other epistemologies too because a lot of things that we use as axioms for science are based on intuition and experience. So if we're going to reject those things, we need to do it consistently. And then we've got a problem for science too. Because, you know, like the laws of logic are basically just, we accept them on an intuition. And then, you know, if you read a scientific exp- ex- instrument, that's experience too. So when, when we want to raise that kind of skepticism about our ability to perceive reality, we, we're creating problems for other worldviews. But generally what people do is they're kind of schizophrenic or inconsistent about it. They'll, they'll do it to spiritual things, to things that they consider unreasonable, but they won't do it to things they consider reasonable. Uh, I can't... And there's, that under, there's the underlying assumption of subjectivity, where, which is sort of fundamental to the physicalist explanation that everyone's experience is subjective. And in order for something to be objective or true for everyone, it should be verified by senses. And that is the epistemology, right? And that the, the means to gain truth is through sensory perception or shared sensory perception. And so those kind of assumptions are really at the, I think, the heart of a lot of what was going back and forth. Yeah, right. Yeah, I feel like that point wasn't discussed, but it was actually an underlying disagreement to a lot of the back and forth, which if it was discussed mm-hmm. probably could have made the discussion more fruitful and more to the point and less, yeah. less of it. You know, when, when you're not getting to the actual disagreement and having back and forth, then it, yeah. it doesn't go anywhere. Yeah, I think there was, yeah. uh, when you get into the spirituality, it gets into a person's uh, qualifications and we sort of skip to qualifications and that was a lot of the back and forth. Yeah, and I think at one point also, um, uh, Dr. Howard Resnick accused uh, Matt Delahunty of circular reasoning, and Matt Delahunty was very dismissive of it. He's like, "I'm not, you know, what, what's circular about my reasoning?" And he really failed to saw that a lot of his arguments were based on certain assumptions that he held, namely that uh, he basically uh, had a commitment to philosophical naturalism. You know, everything can be explained by natural causes. That's it. There's only natural causes. If we can't explain it, uh, you know, if we can explain it through a natural cause, that natural cause must be true. And this assumption uh, is really necessary to um, challenge if there's going to be any meaningful debate because it just turns into uh, one person saying I have a spiritual claim and then another person saying, oh, here's a natural explanation that it's not true. Whereas, you know, really, you can't just logically speaking, that's very um, fallacious because you can't just assume that naturalism is true and that everything you can offer a natural explanation for is naturally reducible. Uh, you have to really evaluate things a lot more carefully than that. And Matt Dillahunty wasn't really willing to do that. Yeah, I think it's worth asking if the natural explanation fits too. Like like the, the priming of the pump thing, like sure, you, you can uh, arrive at certain conclusions just based on preconceived notions or um, existing biases. But uh, at what point does your ability to imagine the results you're expecting uh, no longer hold? You know, at what point does your experiences fit so well with the theology and go beyond what your imagination could produce? Yeah. And another part of that is the people who are actually qualified to make these type of assessments are people who know what a genuine spiritual experience is like and can distinguish between a delusory experience and a genuine experience. But Matt Dillahunty himself is not qualified to make those judgments, nor is any natural scientist. It takes someone who actually knows what the genuine experience would be and what a delusory experience would be in order to distinguish. If you're not sufficiently qualified, uh, then you sort of have to suspend your judgment. I'm not sure I would make that. I'm not sure I'd agree, because if we go down the path of saying self-evident truth and then... How does self-evident truth get into somebody's qualification? Because there's so many uh, religious examples of people who are a bit uh, maybe antagonistic and then they have an experience which we'd consider spiritual. 
That's true. I mean, there's, there's that example of a police officer who was investigating the Hare Krishnas, moved into the, the temple and was living in the temple for like a whole year. And eventually he told the devotees what was going on and said he'd had a change of heart and was now actually practicing properly. <laughs> well, even, but even in a shorter time, I mean, that's a year you can say that, okay, that person became qualified. But even someone who's not qualified, if they have some... Because it gets it gets a little tricky if you say, okay, somebody's not qualified, they had that experience, we accept that experience because it aligns with our expectation. But if um, I, I think we have to be careful when we say people are uh, the qualification, because I think that did get a bit testy in the debate. And I I do agree that someone, <laughs> you have to be qualified to perceive spirituality, but it can get tricky in a personal exchange. I guess, well, one thing I would add is that if someone, uh, like the person, um, sort of the example you mentioned, someone has, someone's really antagonistic and they have an experience, you can, there is a sense in which you can evaluate when someone is actually qualified to have an experience. There's certain scripturally grounded um, sort of claims that should hold true. Like if someone is free from anger or someone exhibits, you know, a wide array of qualities, there's sort of a measure that um, you can evaluate whether someone would be having a genuine experience or whether it's some sort of, um, you know, it's not really so accurate. There should be some measurable qualities that someone exhibits. Um, so as a there. result of the experience, you would expect to see something? Or I think it's more if someone is going to have a profound experience, um, you know, or certain Theological frameworks do have a way of delineating what the qualities of an advanced spiritual practitioner are, what the spiritual experiences one should have if they are spiritually advanced are. And you can assess, uh, like a doctor can assess a patient as trained spiritualist, an advanced spiritualist, can see, can understand the types of experiences someone has, understand the type of quality someone has, and see if it matches up. And if it does match up to what the scripturally um, accepted view is, then you can say, okay, this is accurate. Where, you know, if there's some inconsistency, then you can say, okay, this is, you know, likely not uh, so accurate. Like, like we can tell the difference between a, a pure devotee and a sahajya. You know, if someone says, oh, I'm having, you know, dreams with Krishna in them, and this is my form in the spiritual world, but you, they're like externals, or they don't have their life together. It's like, yeah, no, you're imagining that. Yeah. Um, I think rele a relevant point here is um, mental illness. So people say, oh, how do you know it's not just a hallucination and like a psychosis or, you know, people are just imagining a reality that's not actually there. It's like, well, mm -hmm. when people are having a kind of mental illness where they don't see reality clearly and they imagine things that aren't there, there's um, concomitant uh, factors that go along with that. You know, the person will have problems in their interpersonal dealings that they might not be able to hold down a job or, you know, I don't know exact, the exact list of symptoms, but there's signs of uh, ill health. You, you don't get somebody who's failing to perceive reality that's like, you know, holding down, a, the, the, you know, like a really high-end job and has the most amazing interpersonal relationships and all this sort of stuff. At least it's not common if, if you do find it. Yeah. <clears throat> yeah, this is a good point because, you know, someone can say, oh, you're having these experiences because you're priming the pump. But if you're going to try to say that someone's religious experience is like a hallucination or delusion, and they're actually in a very sound mental condition, they're exhibiting positive qualities, they're um, very sane, very functional, and they exhibit all the qualities of a functioning person rather than a delusory person, that's uh, the evidence is far more in favor of the theistic explanation than the natural ex explanation at that point. Um, yeah, that makes sense. I think this is what takes it away from being an appeal to popularity argument. You know, we're not just saying because millions of people have believed it. We're saying because millions of people who are you know healthy, intelligent, you know reasonable mm. people, they felt like they're convinced of it. Like if somebody demonstrates that they have a high ability to comprehend mathematics and then we show them a mathematical proof and they're like oh yeah i'm convinced that this mathematical proof has been demonstrated to me to be true then that counts as evidence i can't understand the mathematical proof myself but i know this person understands math and they feel that it's been demonstrated to them as true so you know like when we like there was a debate william lane craig had on uh 
can't remember how they t- phrased it, but basically they were debating whether it's reasonable for for an intelligent person to believe that science points to theism, something like that. So one of William Lane Craig's answers was, you know, he gave a list of people, you know, here's this scientist, here's this scientist, here's this scientist, and they're all like highly credentialed scientists, you know, and they they feel like it's, re- you know, theism is reasonable. Whereas, you know, you don't get that for the flying spaghetti monster. Like, like the, you know, people mm. offer it as a parody, but nobody actually takes that stuff seriously. And And then some of these parody arguments they give, it's like, what you've basically just given a definition of God and then swapped out one element for a pumpkin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's actually a good point. Uh, you know, people, yeah, they try to equate belief in God with belief in like some great pumpkin monster. But uh, like you said, millions, if not billions of people throughout history, many of them who are very functional, very sane, have had experiences of God. Whereas, you know, I can't think of anyone who actually has perceived a great pumpkin monster. And, you know, that's a very significant fact. It's a very significant fact that you have, uh, you know, of course, just because a belief is popular doesn't mean it's true. But if a large amount of people who are fully functional um, and sane people are experiencing something, it's much harder, in my opinion, to simply dismiss that as some sort of hallucination. Well, also, the we've got to look at the, the so-called naturalistic explanation, you know, the social scientists will be the first to tell us that correlation does not equal causation. I heard, heard mm, one talk yeah. where uh, th- this scientist was saying, you know, you got the audience to repeat it, you know, back to him like three times, correlation does not equal causation. And But then when it comes to spiritual claims, they'll do that left, right, and center. So, you know, if I, if I pray and experience God, then I've primed the pump and there's a natural explanation, you know, they they can induce it supposedly with magnetic resonance and so on or whatever. But if I eat a piece of cake, there's also neurological correlates in my brain. So how do I know there's a real piece of cake? Mm, yeah. Like, yeah. And they would on that too, and they'd probably also say something like, uh, you know, the reason that millions and billions of people believe in God is because of some sort of evolutionary mechanisms and we've evolved to have this sort of sense of religiosity. But I think if someone is going to try to dismiss religion by making these types of claims, they should have sufficient evidence to back it up. And from what I've seen, you know, they really, uh, the evidence is lacking. Um, and it's not very clear to me that just because you can posit some conceivable natural explanation involving evolution, that it necessarily must be true. Well, they should back it up with social science. And often you find those sorts of claims aren't supported by the social claims. Inspiring Philosophy did a video on bias. And he pointed out that actually the research shows, I'll put a link in the description to that video. The research shows that uh, theists are, are actually less prone to um, the bias they're accused of than atheists are. Uh, what is it? What's the bias they call it? The false apprehension of agency? Mm. Something like that. Um, so we don't find that people who believe in God have a t- more of a tendency towards, you know, when they hear a rustle in a bush thinking that there's something scary there when it's just the wind. So mm-hmm. if, if that were the case, that an evolutionary bias which was causing people to uh, anthropomorphize forces of nature, then we should see the bias which is associated with that kind of thing, that, that misapprehension of agency, to be more predominant in theists. And we don't find that when we actually do social science. It's, it's nothing but conjecture. Yeah, exactly. Um, should we play that that clip near the end of the debate that you uh, queued up, Emma Lagora? Is there anything else from the middle, or have we sort of gone through? Uh, I think we kind of discussed a lot of the points without referencing the clips. But yeah, we did. So I've got. Uh, let's do this. Uh, maybe do that one at the end. I've got that one about the Dr. Howard Resnick's point about oneness. Okay. Uh. Sorry, I hope I've got it at the right point. And so I would say in healthy relationships, you know, there's two individuals, but they're one. It's one couple. But if they're if they really merge, it's like codependence. If they're two separate, it's not a good relationship. So I think I would argue that 
almost everywhere you look ontologically in this world, you can find oneness and you can find difference. And that something like that is the ontology, is the relationship between spirit and matter. And I would say consciousness is ultimately spiritual, but it becomes conditioned by, it is conducted by, and is in many ways affected by neurology at the present time in, you know, during our presence in this world. But the very fact that I would say consciousness is a spiritual object obviously interacts with matter uh, because they're not simply different. It's, it's not a strong dualism. Yeah, so I don't know that we got any, and, and this, I'm not faulting you because I, 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 I I get what you're saying. I don't think we got any closer to a definition of what spiritual is. Um, and a lot of that just seemed like, to me, uh, a metaphor and, and a, a different ways to describe stuff. Oh, there's two people, but they're one and, and things like that. And oh, there's matter and then there's spirit. But I took notes on several of the things that you said before that question came in. That I Is that enough or should I keep going? I think, that's, I think that gets to the point. So... What I saw in that is there were a lot of things that Dr. Resnick said sort of combined, spiritual and consciousness and a bunch of things that were thrown together. And then, and there were some, and I, and I see the pushback from Matt Delahanty where he, I can see his point that there was not a specific claim that he was sort of trying to get to, and maybe he was trying to be very specific, but I think a general outlook was presented by Dr. Resnick where uh, you can't explain the physical, you can't explain all of what we experience through physical means. And I think that was the general theme of what was trying to be said. And then Matt sort of dismissed that with, okay, what are you trying to uh, claim specifically? And that was, I think, a difficulty there. Right, yeah, that's a good point. I mean, this whole reductionist thing, it, well, there's so many things that reduce, trying to reduce everything to the physical can't explain. It can't explain consciousness, can't explain qualia, qualia, you know, meaning that the experiences that consciousness has. And it can't explain, you know, the interpersonal relationship and love life and beauty and morality and justice and so on. None, I mean, they can sort of try to explain to some extent, you know, why we think people should get punished because of evolutionary things, but it doesn't really cut it as an explanation. It's, it's not satisfying. Adi Pirsh, did you want to? Um, I didn't have too many thoughts on this point, but um, yeah, I found uh, Dillahunty's response a little underwhelming. Um, I think there could have been a little bit more dialogue there, and it was sort of another instance where Matt was just really dismissive of what uh, Dr. Howard Resnick had to say. And um, I think it's uh, maybe they could have gone a little bit more into how spiritual is conscious. Maybe I think spiritual could have been elaborated on a little bit more. Um, I mean, like the Chaitanya Vaishnava theology holds that the soul is a spiritual being, and consciousness is symptomatic of that uh, spiritual being, and um, maybe some further distinctions between spirit and matter could have been helpful here. Um, but I think by this point, uh, I mean, at this point in the debate, you know, Dill Hunty was sort of set in his, he was in really like debate type of spirit. And at that point, it's just really hard to penetrate into and get into really kind of productive dialogue at that point. Um, I've got one, one more clip then. Um, this is a point where Matt Delahunty accused Dr. Resnick of a logical fallacy. And in my view, he was completely wrong in his accusation. To a slightly different explanation doesn't change the fact that it was a fallacy. But Which stop was, analyzing my psyche okay, and have a discussion about actual epistemology. Where was the fallacy? The fallacy was you claimed that I cared about objective truth and that I did not claim about what your, I did not care about your position. If your position is in fact objectively true, then it is included in that set. No. I, um, so to me, this went back and forth. Matt Dillahunty is 100% wrong there because his assumption 
yeah, he's trying to say that being interested in absolute truth and, and, you know, the truth is identical with knowing where to look for it. I mean, there's that old funny story of the, the drunk man who's looking for his car keys and somebody comes up and says, oh, you're looking, you know, you lost your car keys. Where did you lose them? Oh, I lost them over there. Well, why are you looking for them here? Because the light's here. And of course, we're not accusing <laughs> Matt of being so silly, but the point is, it's just a funny story, but the the point I want to make is that somebody can be interested in looking for the truth. Like, you know, scientists want to discover a cure for some illness and they're trying so many different things, but there's, you know, a particular class of compounds as a drug, which they're just not exploring. Why aren't they exploring it? If they want to find the cure and the cure is found in that compound, then they should be looking in that compound. That's basically what Matt's argument would look like if we applied it to science. But clearly, you know, mm -hmm. being interested in truth and knowing that it can be found in religion are two very different things. If you knew it would be found in religion, mm -hmm. then you'd have to have foreknowledge about what the truth was. And because you don't have the truth yet, you don't know what it looks like. Mm -hmm. So I was a lot more sympathetic to Matt Dillahunty in this. <laughs> I did feel like he was, uh, I, I kind of agreed with his point, frankly, that I think there were personal sort of, Matt was saying, you're trying to analyze my psyche. I'm just asking about what is the means to gain objective truth. That was what I saw as his argument. And maybe it was a little different, but I think there wasn't that emphasis on just how do we evaluate truth? And then it got a little bit too personal into, okay, are you qualified to evaluate truth? And then what truths are you... And if if that is the claim, it should just be laid out very uh, very plainly instead of insinuating it. So I was a lot more sympathetic to Matt Dillahunty in that. Well, I, I do think when I listened to it back, I could see there were ways in which Dr. Resnick was perhaps ruffling feathers in the way he said things. Like he'd say something and be like, you know, I'm going to say this point and Matt won't be satisfied, but anyway. And then you could see Matt getting agitated. So... I do think mm. Matt got overly agitated, but I can see how Dr. Resnick was saying things in, in ways which which added to that. Mm. Um, yeah, I mean, it is a good point, but I think Dr. Resnick was making a valid point about, you know, being qualified. But I think some of the things Dr. Resnick said, he wasn't actually analyzing his psyche. He was just like, Matt offered an objection, like, oh, so how do I tell your religion's true versus Johnny down the street who thinks you're all going to hell? And Well, to be fair, he wasn't saying how do I tell or how can I tell? It was what is the means by which we can tell? It was a, it was a fair question. I've got no problem with yeah. that. But mm -hmm. uh, then Dr. Resnick said, I know you were raised, you know, in a background mm. that's got Christianity and so on. But, you know, there's, a, he was, yeah. and then I think Dr. You know, mm. I feel like Dr. Resnick was going to make lots of points and got cut off. And I kind of would have liked to hear him make some of his yeah. points. But I think he, what he was going to say is, you know, I know based on your background, this is your experience of theology, <clears throat> but actually there's another theology which doesn't have that problem. And here it is. Well, well, to be but if you take the other side, then he's not. You don't have to say, okay, which one is true? It's like, okay, so then how do you evaluate each one independently? Also, yeah, I mean, mm. oh, do you want to say something, Eddie? Yeah, I think there's two points. One, I I do agree that um, in a debate, both parties should be well informed about what the other party is going to argue. And in this case, Matt Dillahunty is probably more used to arguing with. Uh, Christians. So, uh, I mean, the Chaitanya Vaishnava theology, it, it basically, it does have an argument within its theological framework for why these are not conflicting claims, why actually when a Christian is talking about God, maybe in a slightly different way, um, why it's not just totally out and out wrong. It it's, can sort of be accommodated within the Chaitanya Vaishnava view. I think some more nuanced discussion of theology at some point could have actually shed some light on that question and um, could have actually worked towards answering it. But I think a second point is also, this is where uh, Anuman comes in, uh, like uh, inferential reasoning. I think these types of claims, even though the Chaitanya Vaishnava theology 
holds that testimony is the most reliable way. Uh, I think these types of claims, like why is this claim more rational than that claim? Uh, I think those types of questions can be settled with uh, reasoning, and that could have been a good point to explain that. It's not that reasoning supersedes scriptural testimony, but when we have a certain claim and we establish by scriptural testimony and someone else has another claim, in those instances, I think we're, one is very uh, justified in using reason to show why uh, one particular claim is more rational than the other. For instance, just it's, you know, rationally, you don't even need to bring religion or theology into this. Rationally, it just makes much more sense that if God is all loving um, and all kind, that he wouldn't want to um, make the world in such a way that certain people could uh, fail to know him and then go to hell forever. Like, rationally, you don't even need to bring in theology. You can just bring in reason. You know, if someone is going to claim that my religion is right, everyone else is wrong, they're going to hell. You can use reason to show why that's inconsistent with the idea of an all-loving God. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think that question could have been addressed a little more, but I think Dr. Resnick was trying to explain things, Matt kept cutting him off, and it sort of prevented any really meaningful dialogue yeah. being had about well, this point. Yeah. And, and that clip especially, it was, uh, was it that clip or your example, Arjun, about how, okay, we want to evaluate different religions. So in what way can we evaluate them? And then I think it had gotten to the point of the spiritual, uh, I'm not even sure it was there, the spiritual epistemology or material epistemology, if that's... Uh, um, yeah, I'm not sure where it went after that. Um, I think that's a yeah. good point about um, like we in the comments there were some accusations of uh, Dr. Resnick uh, started out by rejecting postmodernism, you know, the idea that we all have our relative own relative truth, and then went on to make a, a strong case for it. So their accusation was when he said, you know, there's 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 great truth found in many religions. People were accusing us of. Uh, postmodernism or sub subjectivism for that, mm -hmm. which uh, I think, you know, th that's a whole discussion all on its own. Like lots of these points, <clears throat> often when you debate these atheists, they'll uh, accuse you of um, dodging questions. It's like, no, that's, a, that's another topic. It's like, well, if we want to, mm -hmm. you know, explain the ways in which our theology holds that there's some truth in these other theologies, you know, we could we could spend 30 minutes on that. We're here to have a discussion on epistemology. Mm -hmm. But we should probably say something on it. Like, uh, Freelance, uh, Dr. Resnick made one point to say that I think some claims are just irrational on their face. You know, we, you know, we, we, when we're talking about competing worldviews, it's not just a matter of opinion. It's not just like, well, Johnny down the street thinks you're going to, he to, to hell. It's like, yeah, but the, the claim that Johnny's making is logically incoherent on his face. So there's not really any kind of competition. You know, it's like the square triangle thing. Johnny's talking about a square triangle. Uh, square triangles can't exist. So uh, next. <laughs> mm -hmm. ah. Yeah, I think that is a good point to keep in mind. I mean, these discussions, um, especially if you're going to bring in theology uh, into place, it really does get you in move you in a direction where you will have to spend like 30 minutes explaining things and that just really does derail the topic of the yeah. conversation actually i it was it was funny like the the problem of evil is actually a theological argument people don't realize that mm -hmm. it's uh, like you know on atheism it's pretty hard to make a case for moral realism so mm -hmm. if you accept naturalism then how can you objectively say that you know something is wrong that what god did in the bible or you know whatever mm -hmm. other thing you know that for you know the problem of evil is uh, you know if god's all good and all powerful and all knowing then why does he allow people to suffer because he knows about it and he could stop it and he doesn't want it to happen these things are inconsistent that's a theological argument it's as you know because mm -hmm. you need to enter what well, um what you know some of the more philo philosophically coherent atheists will say is all we're doing is looking at theology looking at a given theology to see if it's internally consistent at that point you're doing mm -hmm. theology and then when when someone offers a theological argument then you need to do theology in response you can't just do you know naturalistic arguments and stuff you've got to give a theological argument to a theological argument 
And uh, I was once, I spent a couple minutes in this one debate forum for atheists and the problem of evil came up and I was offering answers and that one of the moderators got called in and was accusing me of preaching. It's like, I'm just explaining <laughs> how our theology is consistent with the problem of evil. How is that preaching? Yeah. And then I was thinking about it a day later. I mean, I left that group. It was so obnoxious. But and the problem is, well, someone asked me a theological question, so I had to give a theological answer. That's why it looked like <laughs> yeah. preaching. Yeah. I can't remember exactly how yeah. that was related. It's true, though. Those There are certain questions that you can't answer independently of a, uh, of a theology. Even if you're primarily doing philosophy, you have to be informed about a particular theology and evaluate its internal coherence, but that requires some knowledge of theology still. And I think the, the there's a aversion to bringing up theology because, okay, that's your belief. Let's just argue within your belief. And then there's this aversion because it, the idea is, okay, that's just your belief system. What's the point of your belief system? I want to talk about the truth, right? So the... But the fact is that there's already a belief system in place with the naturalism that's not been, that's just assumed, right? Mm -hmm. And you, using that that belief system or your belief system, there's still going to be a belief system. Yeah. And actually amongst like serious philosophers of religion, they do take the time, at least if they're uh, trying to do a good job, of actually trying to learn the uh, person they're arguing, like they're trying to learn the op opposition's beliefs that requires knowing some knowledge of theology. You know, it's not that you can say, oh, I'm an atheist, I don't believe in your theology, therefore I don't want to hear about it. If you're going to critique it, you should actually know what it's saying so that you can respond to it and not just dismiss it without actually any critical thought. Well, Matt Matt does know a lot about Christianity. A lot of these guys, Matt, Aaron Ra, and so on, they, they read the Bible. They, they, some, they probably read the Bible more than mm -hmm. a lot of Christians. Some of them give this argument <laughs> that uh, if you want to make atheists, get people to read the Bible... <laughs> um, I don't anyway um, so yeah they, they have studied Christianity but like, like we're saying Matt hasn't studied our theology and wasn't knowing what the arguments were yeah. he did say that he doesn't like to prepare for a person he likes to prepare for a subject so he didn't really do any you know study of Dr. Howard Resnick's work mm -hmm. going into it but I think like some some person, uh, one guy made the suggestion that a higher quality discussion could be had if the interlocutors know each other's positions well. So it might make sense for them to exchange essays mm -hmm. ahead of time. Yeah. I know. Or uh, something more focused. Yeah. Yeah, I know uh, William Lane Craig, when he gets into a debate, he thoroughly prepares, he, you know, reads the opposition, prepares counter arguments. I mean, if you're just sort of coming into it unprepared and you're not even willing to really hear the other person's uh, points, it, it just becomes very sloppy. I think, yeah, it would have been improved if uh, Dillahunty had some knowledge of um, our theology and then, you know, just inform his rebuttals in a more... Um, a coherent manner and more intelligible manner. Yeah. And the, the argument could be focused more where I think the idea of epistemology as a focused area was good. Maybe somehow, I think it got off track where even in the beginning, I think the, uh, the introductory statement sort of veered off of epistemology immediately into theology. And so like I think Adipurush was saying, the essays or some sort of position because mm -hmm. uh, I don't think a position was ever established on mm -hmm. on either side in the beginning. I mean, we had the introduction from Matt Delahanty, which talked about rationalism, and then there was sort of an agreement from Dr. Resnick's side, and Dr. Resnick talked about uh, moral, uh, some some issues of morality and how religious people can reason about morality without only referencing religious scriptures or reason about it in a way that's relevant to everyone. And that was okay, but it wasn't on the topic of the of epistemology specifically. So I do think it got oh. it just splayed out everywhere. Well, that morality thing that Dr. Resnick wanted to address that because it's a widely held misconception of religion that morality is something that's mm -hmm. handed to you and you can't use your own reasoning faculties to figure out right from wrong, which is a fair objection. But it's it's a widespread mm -hmm. misunderstanding among atheists that this is what religion means and. Or at least it's an objection that's offered. So it's it's worth pointing out just to clear things up, you know, in a in public forum that, you know, and within our Hare Krishna theology, you you can reason about morality and follow your heart 
to to what's right and wrong. It's just that you know that the guidance from the scripture is there to give you a full deck of cards to work with, so to speak. You know, when someone gives you good advice and good counsel, you can make better decisions, but you're still making your own decision. Mm-hmm. Um, back to the the disagreement among theologies thing. Uh, Dr. Resnick did point out that there's a lot of serious philosophy behind that. And that might just sound like an mm-hmm. assertion, but like these, you know, like to go into the actual serious philosophy would be like a whole nother discussion. But uh, mm-hmm. I did an interview with a Kanditi recently on my channel and we were talking about ph- the place of philosophy. And one point was made is that, um, you know, philosophy is no longer taken seriously. And scientists have been allowed to pronounce on philosophy. And when they do so, people take accept it to be science even though it's philosophy but the problem is these scientists who are pronouncing on philosophy aren't trained in philosophy and they don't undergo any of the process of ensuring you're doing good philosophy so within philosophy there's debate and discussion and so on so you put together an idea for it and other people pick it apart and then you make a stronger argument and there's back and forth there's all this uh, stuff that goes on to make sure that you're actually doing good philosophy and you're not just like believing anything you want to believe Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I mean that um, that is true. It is a it is a really at the end of the day, it is a very philosophical question. And I think I do recall at one point, Dr. Howard Resnick. Um, I think Matt Dillahunty was sort of asking, "Okay, there's these competing claims. How do we know which one is true?" And I do recall, maybe it's a little bit, the details are a little bit vague, but I do recall Dr. Resnick mentioning logic or reasoning at some point, but somehow, um, I don't know, somehow that didn't register or you maybe Dillahunty was wanting some really long drawn out explanation, but uh, you may, that is, you're right, that is a topic in itself. I think you can say it's a philosophical question, you can answer with philosophy, but if we're going to answer that, we should do it in another video because it's topic in and of itself maybe that could have been i don't know maybe that could have been one way to deal with it um yeah i mean maybe we should say something about it quickly like you've got the elephant analogy right so you've got all these blind men arguing yeah. each holding a different part of the elephant one person holds the tail and says it's like a rope one person holds the trunk and says it's like a hose another holds the leg and says it's like a, a tree trunk uh, another holds the yeah. belly and says it's like a wall and they're all arguing, saying, no, it's this, no, it's that. And this is analogous to different religions arguing about different things. So the yeah. Buddhists are saying, no, it's, it's this is impersonal effulgence. And the Christians are saying, you know, God is great. God is king. And yeah. we're saying the impersonal effulgence is, is coming off of Christian's body. That's a real thing. It exists, but it's not the highest. You yeah. can go there, but it's temporary. And the Christian, you know, God is great and he is the king and that that's one relationship you can have with God, but there's other relationships too. Yeah. Yeah. Implicit in Matt Dillahunty's argument is that one of them's right and one of them's wrong. And that's sort of the end of the discussion. Whereas really it's more nuanced and, you know, two people can have conflicting arguments and they can both be accurately perceiving some divine being but one of them might just be mistaken in claiming that their vision of God is the only vision. You know, it could be the case that, like you said, the elephant is there um, and that there's simply, uh, you know, I think Matt Dillahunty really had this idea that, I think he was sort of presupposing this Christian idea that one must be right and one must be wrong, whereas, you know, they could both be right on some level. And if he'd understood our theology a little bit more, I don't think this would have been such a... Um, he on this topic for so long. I mean, I think that also gets into the the concept of, of logic, right? Yeah. Where you're, you're presupposing a lot of logical argument in, in terms of what is right, what is wrong, what are the rules of logic. So, um, you know, there, there is something more to say about that where we talk about how uh, Chaitanya Vaishnavism it, sits, it doesn't sit on an island, right? It sits in the Vedic tradition. So the Vedic tradition has a deep deep tradition of nyaya and logic and nyaya logic had its various degrees we were talking in arjuna pro his forum about theology and least forum about difference non-difference and how maybe it relates to uh, western logic and conceptions of identity and difference so it, it 
part of it is just that Western logic, which the the church has sort of been a part of, has not taken into account these detailed, uh, if, if you want to call them theological nuances, or maybe not even theological, but just nuances of, of how to describe reality. Yeah. Yeah, so, yeah, I think, I don't know, maybe in the future, uh, these types of debates would be more productive if each debater um, you know, read an essay, like we've said, or try to understand the other person's position and, uh, you know, didn't sort of take one, bring one's assumptions to the table without really trying to understand what the other party is saying. Because um, I think in instances like these, you know, it, it, there's this sort of uh, kind of, I think Matt Dillahunty had this real kind of Christian, had a lot of assumptions that related to Christianity, and it's sort of seeped into his discussion with Dr. Resnick um, in it and could have been more productive without the assumptions brought to the table. My, my kids have woken up now. <laughs> um, yeah, we've got Graham Oppie uh, discussing. I think this one will actually be a discussion because Graham Oppie is a real gentleman and a scholar. He's discussing with Dr. Resnick in, what is it, two weeks' time? And uh, maybe three weeks, and that should be that should be quite interesting. And we should probably put together an essay to, to send to Oppie so that he knows what what we're going to be presenting. So, um, uh, just back on that point of religions disagreeing. I mean, obviously, if if two religions are making mutually exclusive claims, they can't both be right in the same sense. Mm. So, you know, if if the Buddhists claim the the absolute truth is that you know impersonal effulgence and we claim the absolute truth as a person those two claims can't be true but we can water one of the claims down and make it true in a sense which is harmonious mm -hmm. with the other one and say you know the impersonal effulgence is yeah. real but it's not the highest yeah exactly i know that uh some people say that uh, there's two positions religious ex exclusivism or one religion's right or religious pluralism or every religion's wrong and they say that I mean, every religion's right, uh, and they say that because religious pluralism can't be true, that the truth must be exclusivist. But there's actually a third category called religious inclusivism, where there's one religion that has, you know, the best understanding, you could say. But other religions are not wrong, but they just sort of have varying degrees of that truth. And some of them might have, you know, 99% of the degrees of truth right. Some of them might be, you know, have 50% right, 0% right. So it's not this black and white. It's either they're all true or one is true. You know, there's another position which i think is actually the most rational uh, in this case the inclusivist position and uh, I, i'd like to bring in self-evident epistemology there like we talk about i think i think lots of religions talk about you can you know the scriptures too is because you know you read it and it just r rings true it's that it, you, you apply it and it, the, your experiences are consistent and so on so when I think we can say that the most, right? Like you read Bhagavad Gita, Bhagavad Tam, Chaitanya Charitamrita, and you get the best explanation for all the other religions. It's it's clearly the most comprehensive. You you can now understand mm -hmm. why Christianity, what they do, what they're on about, why it works. You can understand Buddhism. You can understand, you know, Islam and so on. Whereas in these other, you know, it's like if you've got a hundred dollars and you've also got five dollars, <clears throat> but um, within Christianity, they they can't explain all of what we do and why it works and one of the objections which is offered um sam harris offered it in a debate i think with william lane craig and the questions when the public was asking questions and uh <clears throat> the point was you know like so jesus rose from the dead like so um and you know did all this healing and stuff sai baba did heaps of healing too does that mean hinduism is also true it's like, well, the Christians, they just don't have an answer. They're just like, you know, like you get like <laughs> lawyers and all these doctors and all these like really professional people saying Sai Baba healed their baby or, you know, healed them or healed their mom or something like that. Or, you know, produced ashes, produced pictures and so on. Um, of course, from a Vaishnava point of view, we're not so impressed with those kind of mystic cities. We're more impressed with um, the ability to, you know, awaken pure love for God. But still, you know, that this argument's there and it's like, oh, well, we can explain why Sai Baba has that ability because of mystic cities and so on, you know, yogi from a past mm -hmm. life and whatnot. Whereas the Christians are just like, oh, I don't know, must just be false allegations, can't be true. It's like, well, you've got the same mm -hmm. standard of evidence or even weaker for Jesus. You've got 2,000 years ago some peasants reporting that Jesus rose from the dead. How is that uh, better evidence than what we have for Sai Baba doing all these miracles? 
Mm. Uh, there was, I was talking about explanatory power and how you can see how we we have the more comprehensive theology. We've kind of gotten on to another to- on to another topic, but I guess it's it's helpful to elucidate these subjects which weren't able to be elucidated in the debate. Uh, if mm-hmm. you can, if do you have any more comments, or should I play the last clip? Yeah, we can get to the last clip. It's probably time to start winding down. I think. Do you want to have this video? You want to have this video be too long? Ah, yeah. Okay. This is the uh, last one that Amalagora queued up. Simple claim that um, within spiritual practice, one has self-evident or experiences of self-evident truth, which become properly basic as a foundation to build a knowledge system. I hope I, I'm giving. I, I, I'm not. I'm not, maybe I, I missed it. Maybe um, give an analogy or an example. Okay. Okay. Just like actually, you mentioned earlier the um, the the idea that when you're dreaming, then you wake up and you make a quick decision that the world of awake consciousness is somehow ontologically superior to to the dream state, although yes. we can't prove that. And and you think that's self evident? Yeah. Yeah, I don't. Which is why when I talked about it, I described the reasons why I find it. Whereas. Now, granted, there is a de facto assumption that I am preferring a, a world that is not absurd. But there are things that happen in the dream world that are absurd and different. And it's not just about like a quality of experience. It would be like, as a thought experiment, could you imagine sitting here, you and I think we're both awake right now, and then you wake. Here. Okay. Um, do you want to comment? Yeah, he gets in, yeah, he gets into a whole like sort of thought experiment. But the, his point was that I don't accept this reality as self-evident. <laughs> I'm just reasoning that it's self-evident. So he kind of got into back to where he was in the beginning that uh, I'm just rational because I'm pretty sure I should be rational. So, he, But at the same time, I think after that, um, we don't have to go further in the clips, but I think he sort of accepted that argument that, okay, that is an epistemological claim, right? That's a truth claim, that I'm accepting truth because of its self-evident nature. And you can't reject that because that's how we deal with reality. So I think that claim was sort of, I think the discussion uh, took some, uh, had some common ground there. And yeah, but his, his point was, uh, I don't just accept blindly that I'm awake and this is superior to my dreaming state. I've applied rational rules and I want to use those rational rules to evaluate an epistemology. And I don't think that that's a really valid claim because nobody operates like that. Nobody thinks to themselves, well, gee, you know, I'm going to go to work today because I'm pretty sure rationally that it's not a dream what I, that it, this is not a dream. I'm pretty sure rationally that that was a dream what I experienced. Nobody does that. We don't evaluate our reality based on those kind of, on that type of reasoning. So trying to apply that in an epistemological way, it seems just uh, not really relevant. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, I think this is itself is a, a, Point that could be explored in much greater depth. And um, I know Dr. Resnick is going to debate this at further length with Dr. Oppie, but um, I mean, I think, okay, the dream state and the waking state is just one example of a self-evident truth. There's other things that we hold to be self-evident, like um, like the belief that other people have minds like ours, the belief that there's mathematical laws, the belief that there's a real world outside of our mind. And I think, you know, Dillahunty is sort of, t- I mean, Dillahunty is his attitude is like, okay, well, I can sort of uh, rationalize why my dream uh, waking state is more um, rational than my dream state. Therefore, there is no such thing as a self-evident truth. Um, but I think, you know, if you look at other examples, it you do really have to come to the terms of the fact that there are certain things that we just have to accept as self-evident. Um, maybe the dream state and waking state is not the best example, but uh, like I said, you know the belief that uh, there's mathematical laws, the belief that there's logical laws, the belief that there's a real world outside of your mind. These are not things that you can really rationalize or prove so much. You do sort of have to accept them. And uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think much, I mean, I think it might be, in one case, there's a sense in which you can, uh, you can rationally speak about certain beliefs, like, um, you know, the fact that this real there's a real world outside of our mind, like, it's a self-evident truth, but retroactively you can, 
you know, you can show that, you know, this world is logically coherent. There's nothing that really gives us reason to believe that this isn't a hallucination. You know, the laws of nature are perfectly consistent. The experiences that we have are of the type we would expect if the world was real. So sure, there is some way to uh, rationally justify these. But um, I mean, some things I think you do really, uh, I think that Dillahunty's dismissal of a self-evident truth is, um, uh, I think it's a little too quick of a dismissal. I'd like to add something here. So with, I, th- I think I agree where he wasn't able to justify self-evident truth in his epistemology, and that's why he wanted to dismiss it, but he couldn't, right? He, mm-hmm. he sort of was trying to have both, straddle both sides. Well, I'm rational about my truth, and, but at the same time, I do recognize that I can't be rational about it, and it's because the epistemology doesn't support it. And I think we need to show that our Vaishnava Vedic epistemology is, is consistent, that we, our epistemology can tell us that the world is rational according to those basic belief systems that we are agreeing on. And we don't prove it. Our epistemology doesn't say that it's true because we've proved it. Our epistemology says that it's true because of testimony. And there is testimony that it's true from either uh, either authorities that are just Shabda or authorities that are a Porashaya Shabda. So our, our epistemology can explain these things to us and we can follow a fully rational epistemology. So I think that was really missing. Yeah, I think it's also hard to, um, it's a hard topic to do and just sort of at the tail end of a debate. Um, Yeah, yeah, but yeah, I think there's also two dimensions to um, the epistemology. One is the, there's a sense in which it's self-evident and, you know, it's rational. I would argue it's rational to accept God based on scripture and, you know, (laughs) testimonies and saints and scriptures verify it. Therefore, you can believe it. And there's this sort of self-evident component of religious experiences. You have a certain profound religious experience. You know, it when you're experiencing it, it, it becomes as self-evident to you that that's a real experience as it's as self-evident that someone is actually perceiving a real world outside of their mind. So I think there is a real sense in which there's something that can be self-evident. What I think is a little bit, um, where I think the claim that something is self-evident uh, could use is... Um, like, even though we have self-evident beliefs, when we are presented with this belief, it's self-evident to us that it's true. But then there is a sense in which you can you can also use rationality uh, or reasoning to rationalize that belief also. Like, um, you know, I can say that it's self-evident to me that uh, there's a real world outside of my mind. That To me, that's self-evident. Um, but then retroactively, having accepted that belief, there are other things I can do to show that it is rational and that I'm rational and not challenging that belief or changing my mind about it. Um, and I think there are some strategies we can do to demonstrate that uh, scriptural testimony or Shabda is like this. You know, it's self-evident to accept Shabda on its basis or to have an experience um, relating to um, Krishna consciousness and that be self-evident. But then at the same time, I think we can also retroactively um, demonstrate that it's uh, rational. Um, you know, we can demonstrate that the idea of God is logically coherent, that a theistic worldview is more coherent than a naturalistic worldview, that the experiences you have with a theistic um, world, you know, the experiences you have by being in Krishna consciousness confirm the theistic worldview. There are sort of, I think, strategies you can do to verify these self-evident beliefs, um, but it may not be necessarily be the basis by which you accept them. Um, yeah, that... I, I agree with that. And, and that doesn't prove it, right? Where you people are saying, okay, give me proof. That's not a valid thing that we want to say that we can prove to anybody, right? We're offering reasons that are rational. And if somebody is up to that qualification, they would accept it. I think that's as far as we can take that. Yeah. Yeah, personally, I think that um, all you can do is really show that theism and Krishna consciousness is rational. Um, you know, you can show it's logically coherent. You can show that the experiences are the type you would expect if the belief is true. At a certain point, it does require a certain level of faith. And faith is something you have to invest either in naturalism or theism. So, you know, I don't think faith itself is necessarily irrational. Maybe placing your faith irrationally is irrational. But I think theism provides a defensible worldview. 
And you can have self-evident um, experiences and there be self-evident truths. And the, the goal of a philosopher then is maybe not so much to prove that it's true or to prove that you had a self-evident experience. If it's self-evident, you don't need proof, but to prove that it's at least rational um, after the fact. Yeah, yeah, I agree. Can you explain how naturalism requires faith? Yeah, um, we don't know that this world can be explained solely by a naturalistic worldview. There's many things that we simply don't know. There's many things that we have to speculate about. Um, for instance, you know, Matt Dillahunty said that when a person is having a religious experience, it's priming the pump. Uh, okay, that's one explanation, sure. There's also a theistic explanation for that same phenomenon. Why should we accept the natural explanation over the theistic phenomenon without really critically analyzing it or, you know, demonstrating it to be true? You know, at a certain point, it requ- you're presented with two options and you have to place your faith somewhere. And it's just as much of an act of faith to place your faith uh, in the naturalistic explanation when there's no evidence for it, really, than the theistic explanation. I mean, a lot of things are really very speculative, speculative like... Um, that was one example. Um, you know, there's a lot of just, uh, you could say there's a lot of gaps in our naturalistic account and the scientific ways to say, okay, or the maybe not scientific, but, you know, the atheist ways to say, okay, well, you know, God doesn't exist, so this nap has to be explained by naturalism in some way. Therefore, even though we don't know how it uh, can be explained, we have to assume it's a naturalistic explanation. You know, this kind of naturalism of the gaps approach. And that itself requires faith, uh, I would argue. Right. One point I like to make in these debates is um, the need for consistency. Like I said earlier about how we should apply the same level of skepticism that we apply to theism, to science. Uh, And so in that regard, I think a lot of this, uh, you know, like the problem of solipsism and whether truth can be self-evident is in some sense irrelevant because all you're establishing with that is your starting point of um, how much confidence you can have in your worldview. So we can think of this like uh, brackets that, you know, like you have a certain idea and you you put brackets around it and, the, and outside of the brackets, you, you know, you mentioned everything inside these brackets. Here's the disclaimer. I know this to be true with this de- degree of certainty. So if you have self-evident truth and like I know with absolute certainty that I can trust the laws of logic, I know that there's real people outside of my mind and I know when my senses are experiencing things that most of the time is something real. Sometimes my senses deceive me, but you you have like all these starting points and you say, I know these starting points with these degrees of certainty and that's the brackets you put around your, your knowledge system. So if you're consistent with that and it's, you, you put your brackets and you know, your disclaimer, this is how much certainty I have, then it's like if you're measuring the height of people and you put them all on stilts, you're going to measure the same dif- distance. You take the stilts off of them, you still measure the same difference in everybody's height. But if you're inconsistent about it and you put uh, science on really high stilts and then anything that's theistic or supernatural, you cut the stilts off, then you're going to measure a huge difference. And I think this is what a lot of skeptics do is they, they, they apply, you know, they've got their skepticism knob. This was an argument David Wood gave. Mm-hmm. And then when they, they look at theology, they put their skepticism knob up really high. And then when they look at science, they crank it down again. And if, mm. and if, if you don't do that, if you're consistent, then, you know, it's like, well, I don't know for sure the material world exists, but I have a pragmatic epistemology. When I, when I run on the belief that the material world is real, then my experiences work well. You know, this belief is, is beneficial and it yields practical results. Behaving as if gravity is real stops me from dying. And, you know, I, so much technology is produced based on understanding how gravity works. So it's practical. In a similar way, I don't know if Krishna consciousness is true, but I know that when I apply the theology, I'm happy. You know, I have quality relationships. I have nice experiences. There's a deep satisfaction I get inside my soul. So if you have this skeptical epistemology, you say, well, I don't know it's true, nor do I know if the material world exists, but I know that it's beneficial and I get practical results by applying it. And, it's, and then if you go the other, other extreme and you say, I have self-evident truth, then you can come to the point where it's like, I know this theology is true because it's self-evident. I'd like mm-hmm. to add something there because I think this um, this topic was brought up. I think we didn't discuss it, but the claim that Krishna consciousness is a science. I think this claim was brought up by Dr. Resnick, and that's where I think a lot of the discussion was at. And I think that's kind of what you were bringing up, Arjun, that um, that how we're we're going to make claims, and then we're going to give different explanations 
and we don't want to reject the theistic explanation or a supernatural explanation. But the counter the counter argument is that supernatural is outside the bounds of the definition of science. And that's I think that's a whole topic, a whole other discussion that and that might be a nice topic, either a debate or a discussion about what is science and how do we consider ourselves a science? Because um, there's one thing to say, okay, there's a science of our experience. How are we using science to verify a theological claim? But there's another aspect of science where if we talk about origin of life and we say, okay, there's a theistic explanation of the origin of life, and then there's a counter argument that it's not scientific because it's not, um, it's not natural, right? So that the definition of science is a natural explanation, and then you're bringing in something that involves conscious agency, which is then outside the bounds of science. So I think there's some more detailed discussion that can take place about mm. that. Yeah, that's, uh, that is a very deep um, discussion. Yeah, it's actually, um, there's actually a lot of circular reasoning involved in science in one sense. They say, um, here's a phenomenon. There is no God. Uh, therefore, there's a natural explanation of it. Therefore, there is no God. You know, it's or, or assuming... by the de- Go ahead. Yeah, they basically have to assume that there's no God in order to draw their conclusions, but that's basically a sense of circular reasoning, and I think it creates this problem, creates a lot of problems, and it leads to this sort of scientism outlook, and it leads to this view that there's no need for God, and science can explain everything. Where really, science explains everything because it, uh, in terms of natural terms, because it's discounted God as a possibility for. Um, it's discounted God as an explanation as one of its assumptions. So I think there's a deeper, I don't think it's as much as an assumption and they will say this, that they're not going to say we, we have discounted God or we assume God doesn't exist. They will say by the definition of science, we've, we're just operating by the definition of science. Mm -hmm. And I think part of it is this uh, dichotomy um, of a less sophisticated explanation of God where we've not, uh, we in the sense of a theistic community in general, which is huge, but that we've not come up with sufficiently uh, sufficiently rational explanations of how God is working in the material world. And then we have to say, okay, it's God. God did it. Mm. And th- that whole argument was what uh, what science rejected, I don't know, a few hundred years ago and has made progress, right? Where they say, that's not a that's not a way that we can move forward. Maybe that's true or not, but let's just assume it's not because if it is true, we can't move forward with a scientific or a, or a natural explanation. So whether it's true or not is not relevant to science. And our purpose in science is to find out truth in a natural way. So there is, a, I think, a deeper discussion. And we have to, I think, as a theistic community, give more rational explanations for a lot of, mm. for a lot of phenomenon that we assume. That's true. Yeah, I think a lot of people, when you talk about origin of life, they, you know, they, there's this caricature of some sort of young Earth creationism who said it was, you know, God created it five thousand years ago, and yeah, that's sort of the, that's sort of the spokesman for the theistic explanation of things. Sometimes, at least, you know, that's the impression you get. Where, yeah, it's like you said, it's much more complicated than, than that. Yeah. Well. Defining science in such a way that excludes theism is just victory by definition. It's essentially circular reasoning. It, it doesn't get us any closer to the truth. All it, or when you set up your knowledge, your filter in such a way that you say we're only accepting these things as science, that that doesn't tell you anything about reality. That only tells you something about your filter that you set up. Yeah, I'm. I'm not sure I'd agree though. I'm not sure I agree with that. I mean, it's, it, you made a good point. It's true. We do need to offer more rational explanations. Uh, Akandiri Das with his uh, project he's doing called Atma Paradigm is, is, is getting into detail with a lot of science and quoting a lot of scientific uh, literature to give arguments how consciousness is, is a foundational aspect of reality and seems to be driving things even at the most foundational levels of, of physics and so on. So um, yeah. that's obviously an in-depth we- thing. Yeah, def- yeah, but it's a whole getting to the root of how you can explain things rationally may require some um, some bra- some assumptions needing to be challenged. Matt Matt was quite reasonable in in some of these topics. Like he he did say like just just because you can't demonstrate your your theology to be true doesn't mean it's not true. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. So he's, he's not getting into this whole, like, I can prove, you know, uh, I know it's false because you can't prove it's true or any of that kind of unreasonable stuff. He's like, it's possible it's true, but unless you give me a good reason to believe it, I'm not convinced. And yeah, he, he, he was, he was doubting that it's a science. And I think we didn't talk about that as much as maybe we should have, but that was a crux of his argument is that you're not telling me a science, you're making a claim and I cannot bring forward a process because I talked about priming the pump. So that discounts that aspect of it being a science. And he was trying to chip away of saying uh, Krishna consciousness is a science. And I think that's a, it's an important uh, topic that we could get into a bit more. Yeah, that is. But maybe I think we'll wrap yeah, up. Yeah, we now. should wrap up. That is a whole nother subject, yeah. but it was touched on briefly. I've, I've heard uh, Dr. Resnick speak about it before that, you know, what would a spiritual science look like? And one of the points he made in the debate was for it to have a spiritual science, it would have to be true that there was an ontological spiritual reality. You know, so mm -hmm. it's not, not none of this postmodernism mm -hmm. stuff. But, you know, I think I like to define science as a reliable method of acquiring knowledge and achieving results. And and that way it's not circular. If you define science as something, you know, naturalistic, then you've just you've just limited the scope of what you can know. So limiting the scope doesn't, it only tells you about things within that scope, but there could be heaps of reality outside your scope. And there could be other ways of knowing that, but you know, a spiritual science should be able to bring about changes of behavior. You know, anyone who's doing bad things in the world and of low moral character claiming to be a bastion of a spiritual science shouldn't be taken seriously. If, if someone wants to proclaim that they're sharing spiritual teachings, they should demonstrate that by having a high quality of consciousness by having you know good moral character. Um, that's just a few points, but anyway, any, any final points to wrap it up before we close it off? Um, I'm good. Yeah, I think we covered some good bases. Um, I think, um, yeah, I think going forward, I think that I'm looking forward to the debate with Afi. I think both parties are have an awareness of the other's um, views. I think it should make for a more productive discussion. Yeah, I'm really excited about Oppie. Um, William Lane Craig described him as the uh, strongest opponent to theism alive. And that's that means a lot coming from William Lane Craig. And I've, <laughs> yeah. I've listened to lots of Oppie's discussions and he's just such a gentleman. Like he's not doing this like trying to score points things. It's not a boxing match for him. He's actually, it seems, trying to uncover the truth and, you know, access good knowledge and mm -hmm. do good philosophy. So it should be a good discussion. Mm -hmm. Cool. So um, thanks for coming on and, and giving your thoughts on the debate. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we hopefully we can do me. this again sometime. Yeah, happy to be here. Yeah, for sure. Cool. So thanks for tuning in and make sure you don't miss the debate with Graham Oppie. This has been our debate review of the discussion, which actually turned out to be a debate between Matt Dillahunty and uh, Dr. Howard Resnick. So... We've got other videos like this that we put out, more debates coming up, and I make short videos arguing philosophical points. So if you like that type of thing, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, let us know what you think down in the comments. Maybe the atheists aren't happy with how we represented the opposition. If you've got objections we didn't answer, then let us know. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.